Hello everybody, we're live, this is the Gin and Tonic Show, and today it is the 22nd of March 2015. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Gin and Tonic Show, where we discuss Islam. We are not interested in your belief or changing your belief or what it is that you believe. We just like to know why you believe what you believe. And we are not Christians. We are not Zoroastrian. We are not Sikhs. We are not Hindus. We are not Rastafarian. We are none of those. We are not racists. Is there an A racist? We are not astrologists either, like an A astrologist. <laughs> I don't even know why there's a word for the opposite of a theist. I, I don't understand that. But anyway, since there is, yes, I am an atheist. I didn't know this. Uh, I actually thought an atheist was something horrible. Now I know it's just somebody who does not believe what a theist believes. In other words, there's nothing wrong with it. And there is nothing that I believe because I am an atheist. In other words, I am not automatically a defender of the... I don't know, the theory of evolution or something. I, I couldn't care less what science is. I couldn't care less what, what any of these people are saying. It does not affect my belief or lack of a belief or the missing belief when it comes to gods. So there you go. So there's nothing else attached to being a non-theist. Same as there is nothing attached to not believing in dragons. I also say there, there can be no dragons because I do not know the same way as I don't say there can be no gods because I do not know. Maybe in a parallel universe somewhere there is a god hiding away somewhere there. And we're talking about Islam. Now, Islam, what we're trying to do is provide objective and truthful information. We're, we're not trying to demonize it. I am one who's always trying to find something positive and there are positive things in Islam. There are nice things that I can say about the Quran. There are some Excuse me, there are some, I've had a like heavy birthday party. I don't know if you can hear this in my voice. Not not full of alcohol because um, I had one one beer just for the, you know, for the birthday toast. But other than that, but it was nice because I, I could look at women. I could actually say hello to a woman or I could kiss them on a cheek. And, and this was just a normal human interaction. I could talk to them about all sorts of things. And nobody chastised me for talking to women. So this is what life is like as an atheist. So we're talking about Islam, where we're trying to look at nice things in Islam, but we do criticize stupid and bad ideas. So in my eyes, Islam is not just another socio-political um, system. It's actually a political ideology. Uh, it's just to just, throw it in. Sorry, go ahead. It's not just another um, religion. It is also a socio-economic system. Because what we have seen again in the discussion on apostasy last week, that people are saying if you leave Islam, it's like treason. You know, it's like um, committing treason against your country, where Islam is perceived as a country, as a state. And that is why I think it's more of a political ideology than anything else. It's, a, it's like this a political right party. The reason why states are having issues right now in the Middle East because the whole idea of a nation state or a nation or a state, three different meanings, um, is lost into a to a strict Islamic community because they encompass all of that into the Ummah. And so that's one of the good reasons why nowadays we're having so many issues with so many Muslim countries because people are having an issue with their identity. Am I Muslim or am I an Iraqi? Or, you know, am I Sunni? Or which one is more of a... Correct label. Or, or no, which... which if I turn my back on which one, which is a more, which is more of a, a bad thing? Yeah. So and then and nowadays they've been, I guess, choosing Islam because they care more about apostates than they do people who turn their back on their country, for example. Do you know what I'm saying? But now all of a sudden it's also a race. Islam. Well, this is what people say. You, you're being <laughs> yeah. Islamophobic. Is Islamophobic. Being yes. And you're being racist. That's one of the things that makes no sense to me because. You know, coming from me, who used to be Muslim, that's just funny. You know? yeah, because you can change your belief. Well, you're, yeah. you're responsible for your belief, but not for yeah. your genes. Well, yeah. Also, on a separate uh, secular note, happy uh, Nowruz New Year to all those who celebrate it. It's the first day of spring on Friday. We're a little late, but I just wanted to say 
happy that to all who follow people in Iran, Kurdish people, Afghanis, Tajiks, or Afghans. They don't like to be called Afghanis, but Afghans. I'm sorry. And happy Noru's to everyone. New Year. I like this celebration a lot because it's a pre-Islamic celebration that has lasted, one of the only ones that has lasted still in the Middle East. And it's just New Year's, and it revolves a lot about around fire. I mean, it has some Zoroastrian roots to it, but it's, right now it's completely a secular kind of religion. And a lot of these countries that celebrate these, a lot of these areas which celebrate them, lots of these religious heads don't like it. They call that, uh, you know, paganism rituals and so I try to make it I try to make sure I celebrate that extra hard every year okay so let's hope this works um, I've just sent dr. Ahmed the the link <clears throat> because he said he's ready brilliant so this actually works this time uh, because there's always yeah, a little bit of uncertainty you never know is it going to work or not so let's let's, let's see what happens if he's going to join us um, so yes, there's, a, and I always like this because of the the the, the S's, the sub C, the you know the seven things starting with S that you are supposed to have on the table, which was always uh, a oh, great yeah, that, That's interesting. I don't really know the history behind that exactly why the seven S's, but yeah, that's exactly one of the things. And it's interesting because you go to a Christian's house, they always have a holy book. You know, they have. You go to a Christian guy's house in Iran, they'll have a Bible. You know, Muslims obviously have a Quran. But I've been noticing, which is very interesting to me, that more and more these past few years, no one puts any book because uh, they've realized this uh, fight amongst religious ideas and this festival, and people have been choosing this festival, and it really, I, I just love that, you know, I love that's the, that, that's ha that is happening. Exactly, yeah. Okay, um, while we're waiting, because what I'm hoping is to see here soon is uh, Professor Arif Ahmed. Um, I think a lot of people know him uh, from from his appearances on, on various shows, on the BBC, on um, different debates that he's had. I think everybody remembers him for his William Lane Craig debate, I mean, which was... <laughs> I had a lot of fun anyway. So what we've got today, the video of the week, um, is one that Arash has chosen, which is a description, which is actually a documentary, how the U.S. should roll back Daesh, how the, um, what the different approaches are. And it's, this it's not a documentary. documentary. This is just a panel at the, Hudson, at the Hudson Institute. It's a think tank. So it's not very exciting. It's more just five people talking. But some of these people who are sitting on this, they come from the uh, Institute for the Study of War. And this institute, I have seen some great analysis from what's going on in the Middle East. And they do some really nice uh, talking about how, where Daesh comes from. Are they Salafi? Are they, how can you fight back against this ideologically? Can you or not? Is it false? Is it not? You know, that's one of the things that they were pointing out. Okay. Because they have... Uh, legitimacy behind their beliefs. How can we fight such things? It's interesting. It's an hour and a half. So, so if know. anybody wants to take a look at this, um, I'm going to put a link later on under the uh, under the video description, and you can just click on that and and take a look. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Now let's let's go to the news quickly. Um, I'm still waiting for Dr. Arif Ahmed, uh, who said he's going to join us shortly <clears throat> and I'm looking forward um, to picking his brain a bit because I appreciate about him that he's a philosopher who does not let the philosopher hang out so much. I don't know if anybody heard his quip on the, the big questions two weeks ago when he was uh, talking to Hamza Tzortes and said that all that Hamza managed is a couple of platitudes <laughs> and a couple of things that were totally nonsensical and now let me address the grown-ups here. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And Nicky Campbell said, yeah, but that was not very complimentary. And then he said, it wasn't intended to be. <laughs> so I like this this human touch and this, this sense of humor, uh, which which is so so fitting and so refreshing. <laughs> I like that so much. Okay, what happens to a man? I mean, I'm in South Africa at the moment. What happens to a man whose penis was amputated after circumcision went wrong? What happens if that man dies? Um, is is the what what happens to a circumcised penis when you're in heaven? Does it does it regrow the skin, or will you be circumcised in heaven as well? I've never heard any 
Islamic uh, text. Wait, so he, he dies during circumcision? Well, what happens if he's circumcised and then he dies? You sue the doctor, that's what you do. No, no when he dies, what is God going to do when he resurrects the human being? Um, because they will all have their original organs back and all their, their little um, quirks and stuff. Will a circumcised man get his uncircumcised penis back? You see, because Islam follows lots of democratic values, at that point, God asks the 72 virgins what they think. <laughs> and, how yeah, that is and that's how. <laughs> ah, there we go. Welcome. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh. Oh, I Ahmed, thank you very much for joining us, and thank yeah, you. I'm, I'm so happy this has worked. Yeah. I don't know if you've um, heard about this, but Google has been fidgeting and fiddling and doing, and they destroyed the Hangout feature, and a lot of um, Hangouts are not working currently, so I'm very happy that we are not plagued by this like we were last week. No, it all seems to be working fine. Thanks. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I don't even know where to start. Um, I, I thought, okay, let me let me just collect a couple of facts to introduce you because, like a like a polite host, I should do these things. And it ended up like fifty pages, and I thought, no, no, I need to cull this a bit because there's so many things that you have done. There are so many things that you have tackled, and I've been, you know, like it's like talking to an old friend because I've seen you with you know with various debates everybody enjoys and, and, and I think everybody remembers the William Lane Craig debate and things like that mm -hmm. so you know having watched you so many times um, on the various stages in various debates having read some of your articles and things like that um, it's, it's like I know you so well <laughs> so it's quite strange actually seeing you here now so this is wonderful so, you are from Cambridge Uni, from university, you're a faculty of uh, philosophy, lecturer, yes. and you're an incredibly busy person. You're also an ex-Muslim, travelled like crazy, you studied in Oxford, I mean just to mention a name, and um, you've, you've done debates against, I think, any, anybody with a, with a name and with a brain. Well, and there is one mind. person that I would like to point out which no, I'm not going to make these quips, you, because you debated Hamza sources, and I'd love to um, hear your thoughts on this, because um, the only account of this I have is by Hamza sources himself, and um, I've asked you a couple of questions on this, because he, he made the most astonishing claims, and I, I was wondering what, what you would say. So, you, you do a lot of philosophy in religion, you do philosophy on apologists, and these are things I'd love to hear from you, because I was just telling people um, two weeks ago when you were on the big questions, um, how you were talking to Hamza, and then you decided to address the grown-ups. And Nikki Campbell said, that was not very complimentary, you you just said, well, it was not intended to be. So, I love your, your sense of humor, I love the way that you are very human in your ways, okay? And now you've you've done this, um, and, and this is something that I like very much. And maybe you can you can talk us through this a little bit. Dicing with death, the analysis of the this hide and seek, and then what what you call the causal decision theory, the evidential decision theory. Maybe you can introduce us and tell us a little bit about what the differences are about causation and decision, because we are faced with this on a like like almost daily basis when we are talking to Islam. Hmm. Okay, good. So there's there's a lot in there. There was uh, there's a point about Hamza, um, and, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to say a bit about that debate. Um, and then there was the question about causal decision theory, and I'm happy to talk about that as well. So maybe I should just start saying a bit about about Hamza. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, who, I think, who approached? Do you want to start at the beginning? Like, who approached yeah. whom? Why did you actually agree to do this? Yeah. It was it was actually it was a colleague of mine who who. Been approached um, about it, um, who wasn't able to, who wasn't able to do it, but who mentioned me, and so Cardiff University got in touch with me, um, and uh, I was happy to agree to do it. Um, and I think I should probably say a little bit about why, you know, why I was I was willing to take part in this. Um, one reason is that um, I'm always interested in taking parts in. Debates. I find it very interesting because it, it forces me to engage with the arguments in some detail. Um, and I always like hearing new arguments, um, and I always like talking to people who are intelligent or who are capable of carrying off arguments. So that was that was a sort of selfish reason for doing so. 
Um, the second reason was that there are things that Hams in particular has said, I mean, arguments that he's given, that seem to me to be um, refutable on more straightforward grounds than those that were often being offered by some of his opponents. So it was good to have an opportunity to attack some of his arguments in a very straightforward and simple way that I thought deserved some publicity. Though in the event, um, he didn't discuss the argument that he uses, I think, the most often, which is the, his version of the, um, the Kalam cosmological argument. Um, and then the third reason was, again, to do with Hamza specifically, and it was, it was more political, if you like. Um, it was related to the fact that he has this view, and I think it's, it's one that sh that's shared by, by many Muslims on his side, which is that opposition to Islam as a religious doctrine and a certain kind of uh, right-wing view of the world, which goes together with perhaps some sort of Western imperialism as it's perceived, support for the State of Israel and so on, that those things are closely allied. Um, and I thought it would be something helpful to do would be to show that actually you can separate those things um, and to say how one could have, for instance, a quite left-wing view of, of Middle Eastern politics, let's say, whilst being entirely hostile to, not only to all religions, but to Islam in particular. So those are the three reasons, I think, that were, were behind my wanting to, wanting to debate, well, take part in debates generally and debate Hamza particularly. Okay, so did, but did you watch some of his previous debates? Because he, I mean, he always uses the um, the Quran argument, where he always says, "Yeah, this is obviously of divine origins, and there is no two ways about that." Yeah, that's right. Um, I saw I saw debates where he he um, I can't remember one where he didn't actually. You're right. Um, I saw debates where he brought up that argument, debates where he brought up the cosmological argument, and then on the night itself, he used an argument which I think he has used in the past, not so frequently. Um, which was an argument, uh, it was really a kind of rehashing of an argument from Richard Swinburne uh, from the 80s, I think, which is an argument about um, uh, consciousness and how, how the existence of consciousness and its impossibility of being explained in any other way gives you ground. Well, the best explanation, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so those, those were arguments that he used on that occasion. Um, uh, the second and third of the ones that I just mentioned were ones that came up in his initial presentation. Um, so it was good to have a chance to attack those, yeah. And how, how did you do that? And why is it that he is under the impression that you were not able to address anything? Okay, well, let's see. Um, I, mean, I think one thing he said was that I spent my time picking holes in his argument. And it's certainly true that some of what I said was aimed at showing why some of his premises were false. And if, if, if that counts as picking holes, then I guess any kind of response to anything will count as picking holes. So it's true that, that that I did that. Now, what were the responses specifically? Well, in the case of the Quranic miracle, um, in essence, my point was a very simple one, that either the evidence is entirely subjective, or if it's objective, um, then it's simply not there. It's just not true that we can find objective evidence of features of the Quran that aren't equaled or better in other works of literature that he too would regard as, as secular. Um, and that sort of dilemma was one that I tried to press on not only in, in my talk, but also um, uh, in the Q&A afterwards. Uh, with regards to the other argument that he brought up, this is the consciousness argument, um, he presented it in the following form. He said, here's consciousness, nothing else can explain it. And then he went through various attempts to explain it and showed that they didn't work. And then he said, therefore, God. Um, and I attacked it simply by saying that his arguments against the alternative forms of explanation were, were inadequate. Um, for one example, my recollection concerning materialism, he attacked the view that, that consciousness is simply a, a certain very complex kind of material phenomenon. Um, he attacked that on the grounds that that amounts to denying the existence of consciousness altogether. Um, but consciousness is an is a indisput indisputable fact of our experience, so you couldn't possibly deny it. Um, but that argument's a non sequitur because there's a difference between reducing one thing to another thing and eliminating the first thing. Those are two quite separate positions in philosophy. And you could certainly believe that consciousness exists um, and that it's, it's directly present to all of us, um, whilst still thinking that we should identify it with uh, physical states of the brain. I myself am not wholly committed to that view, um, but I do have some sympathy with it. But that wasn't relevant for the, uh, for the argument. All that was relevant was that he hadn't refuted it. 
um, so that a premise of his argument was false. He did make one third argument, which was, well, I wasn't, I wasn't really sure whether it was an argument, but there were some comments towards the end of his talk where he, he discussed the idea that we should be grateful to God. And, and I think the argument was, we should be grateful to God, therefore God exists, um, which is, <laughs> I mean, it may be a valid argument, but it's, it's obviously question begging in the sense that nobody would believe the first premise unless they already believed the conclusion. Um, so, um, so it, was, it wasn't really worth my spending very much time um, uh, picking holes, as he would say, in that argument. Um, so that was that was roughly the shape of the things that he said, and then what I said in response. Okay, now if looking back, apart from the Quran argument, obviously, what would you say is the difference in approach between Christians and Muslims? I mean, this must be very similar to what you've heard from others. Yeah, it was it was similar. Somebody actually wrote to me. Um, not too long before the debate, saying that I've actually debated this person before because he is William Lane Craig in another form. Um, and it was true that the style of his argumentation was similar to William Lane Craig's, and the content of at least some of the arguments that he brought up was similar, though in other cases um, they weren't. So for instance, the consciousness argument could have been and has been used um, by Christians. Obviously the Quranic argument could not have been so used. And then the final sequence of words um, could also have come out of the mouth of Christian, I suppose. Um, so in that sense, both in terms of content and he resembled arguments that were available to Christians and in terms of style, he resembled William Lane Craig. Um, one thing I would say, which is a difference between him and Craig, was that um, in my experience, Craig is very good at maintaining a fairly solid flow of argument all the way through the debate. Whereas my sense with Hamza was that things sort of fell apart from time to time as the debate went on. So he wasn't quite so resilient under being pushed as Craig has, has been in my experience. Okay, because I've seen that he's like all over the show at times. Well, actually, I, I made a video and I took William Lane Craig mm. and I took Hamza Tsaltzers explaining the same, um, well, argument mm. at some stage. And I put them on top of each other. Mm. And they were identical in what they were saying, how they were saying it, and what was quite funny. This was uncanny. How they were cop or how Hamza was copying even the gestures and the, the, the slight quip, a little joke at the end. Identical down to the last joke and the gesture. Is that right? Well it doesn't it doesn't surprise me in a way. Um <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, I mean, I think he's. I think he's. He's obviously smart in a way. I mean, he's able to 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 present something that looks like an argument. Um, but I don't think he's got quite the resilience and flexibility of of someone like Craig. And as you said, you know, he tends to to go a little bit all over the place after a while. Um, but yeah. Well, and this is the question that I would have now. If you if you look at Hamza Tsaltzis, is there really any philosophy in what he is saying? Um, well, it seems to me there's a sort of mishmash of philosophies. Um, uh, um, somebody who wrote to me before the debate said he has you know, the equivalent of, of like the first paragraph of Wikipedia on a very large number of subjects. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was apt, um, uh, and that seems to me to be quite right. Um, uh, he has you know, superficial knowledge that would easily impress someone who's completely ignorant about a very large range of subjects. Um, but as soon as you start to probe it, um, he just falls apart altogether. Um, there's also quite a bit of theatricality, you know, there's, there's all the jokes and the, and the humour and so on, um, uh, which I don't mind at all, um, uh, but it may be that that's one of the things, along with the throwing around of terminology that he doesn't really understand, that diverts people's attention from the fact that actually he's, he's, he's talking nonsense a lot of the time. But, but now, if, if we ignore Hamza for the moment, mm -hmm. how much philosophy do you find in religion? Um, well, I think you can find a lot of philosophy in religion. Um, that is to say, if you go back to you know, religious thinkers, Islamic and Christian religious thinkers, many of them were, without a doubt, great philosophers. Um, uh, in Christianity, St. Augustine and, and Thomas Aquinas would be examples of that. Um, and Islam, um, both Averroes and Avicenna would be examples of that, um, to say nothing of more recent times. So I think there's no doubt that you can find a great deal of philosophy allied with religion, 
um, whether the, the philosophical spirit you've held on to consistently really is consistent with religious belief is another question. I myself don't think it is. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that there certainly are very thoughtful and intelligent people who have been religious um, and who have written on these subjects, on, on religious and other philosophical subjects, um, at great length and often in very penetrating ways. Um, uh, you know, again, from Christianity, Descartes would be another example, I suppose, uh, of someone whose religion was, was greatly informed by philosophy. And even Kant, I suppose, you know, had, had a kind of obvious straining or desire to to be religious or a pull towards religion that he never fully managed to expunge from himself. Um, the philosophers, I say, uh, the philosopher, I would say, who probably most effectively combined being a great philosopher with completely expunging the religious impulse was David Hume. Yeah. Okay. Now, how do, now if you compare, now I'm not, I'm leaving out um, Hume at the moment. If if you look at Islamic well, philosophers, if you look at Ghazali, if you look at Ibn Rushd, if you look at these people, have, have you sort of delved into that? Um, not very much. Um, I mean, I, I know a little bit about it from, from second hand, and I know something about, about their achievements as, as you know, um, writers on epistemology and writers on logic and writers on, on other matters that are of concerns to modern philosophy, but I would, I would hesitate to say that I was I had even a, a sort of, you know, more than a passing knowledge uh, of uh, of the work of those philosophers, I do know enough about it though to know that I, you know, I respect them and would take them seriously as thinkers. Um, and I don't think they should be ridiculed in the way that we should reserve for for certain persons alive today who would, who would star themselves as philosophers in the religious tradition. Well, well, Ghazali is the opposite of Ibn Taymiyyah, right? Like it's like you could say that uh, Islamic thinking could go and go towards that way or right now we've been seeing that it's going toward more towards the Ibn Taymiyyah more Salafist kind of uh, tendency right now so they're kind of opposing sides is the way I've been understanding it. So do you mean Mutazilite versus Salafist is that what you said? Uh, excuse me what was that? You say Mutazilite versus Salafist. Is it, was well that? I'm saying like uh, just Islamic thinkers in history you could you could look at Ghazali or you could even look at uh, people like uh, as early as Nasser Khosrow, you know, he is a uh, Islamic philosopher. Mm. Yeah, he's more of a Sufi. Mm. And uh, you can t definitely see the different groups of Muslim uh, practices, different groups of people who practice Muslim in different ways, like uh, Zaydis, for example, mm. or people in Saudi Arabia, maybe Egypt, and people in uh, maybe Tajikistan, they all uh, follow these different types of the interpretation that they have been following historically, maybe. And uh, I've been, I've, the way I've understood it is Azali is in one part of it, is one uh, option. Then there's Ebn Taymiyyah, and then there's the more uh, recent kinds, but. Ghazali goes on more of what you're saying, how it's not really Islamic anymore to some aspects because he's taking it kind of more, uh, trying to make it work with nowadays. Whereas if a Tamiya tries to put away all that and just stick to a philosophy that's around the Quran. Yeah, yeah, um, that sounds that sounds right to me. I mean, I think there's a general problem here. Um, well, I guess there, I mean, there's two problems. And one problem is to do with the fact that, that debates about whether something is truly Muslim or, or truly Jewish or truly Christian can often be fruitless because you, you, know, you can you can say what you like about about a lot of these things and one person will say this is the true you know this is the true interpretation of the Quran and then another person will say well the Quran is a living document and we have to understand it in its in its modern day context and so on and I understand that that's debate that's going on in Islam as much as it goes on in, in Christianity for instance or as much as it goes on with respect to the U.S. Constitution or other sorts of, of documents that have not quite that status, but have have what you might call founding status. Um, so there's there's always that issue that arises, and I don't know that it can be settled on objective grounds. Um, the second issue is that I suppose with with Islam, and maybe this is a this is a problem that goes back all the way to the, the time of Muhammad's death, that there isn't you know, there isn't a canonical authority that that lays down doctrine in the way that you might find, I don't know, with the Catholic Church or something like that. So Islam is much more, if you like, academically freewheeling. 
um, than, than Christianity or than certain types of Christianity, I guess, so that anyone can set themselves up, themselves up as, a, as a scholar of a scholar of Islam and, and you know, issue decrees and so on in the way that you don't find in, in Christianity. And so the religion becomes in a way much more fragmented and it means that it's much more true to say of Islam, I would say, than of Christianity, that it is more or less anything you want it to be. And, and if you look at today, do you see an equivalent for, let's say, Plantinga in, in, in Islam? Do I see an equivalent for Plantinga in Islam? Um, not that I know of, and maybe there are such persons, but not that I, not that I know of. It depends on what respect you mean an equivalent. Um, do you mean I, I, yeah, go on. I, I see him as the leading... Um, well, you can't really say authority, but I, I see that he has a lot of influence in the world or in the philosophical way of looking at Christianity today, that he is the only one who is still bringing out new ideas in the philosophy, philosophical, philosophical realm of Christianity, where, where normally you just see a, a regurgitation of the old stuff, and I see him as, as somebody who is still bringing out stuff. And this is what I find quite impressive, um, even though I think it's total nonsense, of course, but he's still trying, and this is what I don't see in in the um, in the Islamic world. I see, I see. Well, I don't, I don't know of anyone in the Islamic world quite like him. But what sort of things do you think are new ideas that Plantinga has been responsible for? That, that I mean, that are genuinely new, rather than just you know, messing around with definitions. Yeah, but maybe it is messing around with definitions because mm. I am not a philosopher, and I, I, I. I do not know these things. So if I hear these things, they, they, you know, they make sense on a common sense basis. So if I hear these things, and maybe it is messing around with definitions, where I hear that he is saying that da and this actually makes me think. Whereas if I, if I hear a, like, a, like a, a William Lane Craig, it doesn't, where I immediately laugh it off because I know exactly how to uh, refute, rebut, or whatever this, whereas with Plantinga, I actually have to sit down and think. But this is maybe because I'm not trained on the subject. Uh, no, I, no, your 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 comparison is is correct, I and mean, I think there's no there's no question that Plantinga is intellectually in a quite different league from from William Lane Craig, um, uh, and and is is a you know obviously a genuinely brilliant thinker in the way that that you you know you would be hard pressed to say that of William Lane Craig. Um, I suppose the thing that the things that he's best known for um, amongst philosophers are, on the one hand, his modal version of the ontological argument, I and mean, that goes back some some decades now. Um, and on the other hand, his distinctive take on the epistemology of it. Um, but in both cases, it does. I, I myself find that when you actually go through it and try and work out the details of what the argument is doing, um, you find that there are things which are either not particularly original or not not particularly compelling. I mean, I guess that could be said of many many arguments in in the philosophy of religion. In any case, um, and I can understand his position as a leading figure in the subject, um, but I think it's possible, perhaps, for someone who's a relative outsider to overestimate the degree of originality or intellectual interest that this kind of work still is able to generate. <laughs> so that means I have exposed myself as a layman. <laughs> no, not at all. No, I mean, I think I think everything you said was was insightful and correct, and I should say my own, you know, the opinion that I have probably would not be shared by mo many or most philosophers of religion who probably concur with you in saying that Plantinga has done genuinely original groundbreaking work. So my view is in some ways a minority view within the philosophy of religion. Um, on the other hand, if you look at philosophers more generally, I would suspect that many of them are sympathetic to the idea um, that modern analytic philosophy of religion, at least in Christianity, um, has been captured largely by people who are interested only in Christian apologetics and as a result, its intellectual standards are somewhat lower than they are in at least some other areas of the subject. Okay, but can, all right, can, can you do everybody a huge favor? Can you explain why philosophy is necessary today in today's world where everything is based on epistemology and, and, and on, on, on empirical data and, and stuff like that? Why do we still need this philosophical approach where we have the, 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 the scientific approach and everything, and, and everything has been said and done, is there anything original still being done today? Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, I think a lot, and I myself think a good deal of it isn't necessary in the sense that I think there's a good deal that can't be achieved that people used to think could be achieved by mere a priori theorizing. 
Um, and therefore, I think the best work in philosophy is actually done in conjunction with empirical science. So an example of a field of philosophy that's, that's thriving, that's been thriving since the 1980s, I guess, is um, philosophy of mind. Um, where philosophers don't work just by a priori theorizing, but they work by collaborating with neuroscientists, psychologists, and others on experimental work. Um, and what they do is not only help set up and run the experiments, but also think about what interesting philosophical conclusions can be drawn from the experiments. Um, and that's more in line with the way philosophy has been practiced historically. So, for instance, if you think about people like um, Descartes, for example, and Leibniz and Hume even, um, they regarded themselves in a way as much, as, as much scientists as, as philosophers. Um, and I think we should distinguish philosophy not by its methods, but by the questions which it addresses. So there are still interesting questions concerning what is consciousness, uh, or what is the mind, how does the mind work, how do we learn things, um, is there such a thing as right and wrong, or do we just make it all up? That seems to be an important question. Is democracy the best form of government that there is? These are all philosophical questions to which we don't yet know the answers. Um, and I think philosophy should be defined by its adherence to those questions, but should be willing to take up any methods at all in answering them. And that includes, and I think should centrally include, um, empirical methods. Okay, but now if, if we look at this, this hard problem of consciousness, do you think there's ever going to be an answer? Um, yes, I can, I can perfectly well imagine that there will be an answer, um, maybe not in life, my lifetime, perhaps not even in your lifetime, but I expect that there will be an answer in a few hundred years' time. I see no reason in principle why there shouldn't be an answer. Okay, that's good. <laughs> All right. no, now, you know, as I said, I have some sympathy with some sort of you know, materialistic or physicalistic um, approach to these things. Um, but I would say that, that what people sometimes say about consciousness is similar to what people used to say about, about life before, um, before Crick and Watson. That is to say that life was just some, some additional primitive feature of the universe that animated physical objects and the basis of it could never be understood. We now know that that's false. And it was an empirical discovery that that's false. Um, I can easily imagine that such a thing will happen with consciousness um, at some point in the near or perhaps distant future. But isn't that just an elevation from materialist to naturalist? Um, well, um, you can be uh, you can be, I suppose, a naturalist without being a materialist. Uh, but but being, I think I am. Yeah, I mean, being a naturalist. I mean, naturalism itself is a contested term. Um, the way I understand naturalism is more or less, I suppose, something like the way Hume understood it, which is the view that human beings are supposed to be explained in more or less the same ways, on the same principles, as we apply to, to understanding non-human things. Yeah. You might just think that means animals, um, so you might think we're animals, and our, our behaviour, language, for instance, is ultimately to be explained the same way as we explain animal behaviour. Or you might think it's not just that we're animals, it's also that we're physical, so you can explain all aspects of the human world in ultimately physical terms. And those are what you might call two different grades of naturalism. Um, but as I understand it, the animating thought behind naturalism is that um, there's nothing special about us. We're just, we're just you know, parts of the universe and we work in more or less the same way or through complications of more or less the same rules as govern the rest of the universe. Exactly, yeah. That's, that's the way I see it. I mean, I don't that about being material, for instance. So, exactly, so, because I do, I do take um, concepts on like like um, you know mathematics or numbers or irrational numbers or things like that and I do think okay I'm not quite sure about how to qualify logics or, or where to place logics whether logics is only a, a consciousness function or whether it's an empirical function I never know where to where to quite or do, do you have an easy solution well, I have a view, but uh, I, mean, it's, uh, I mean, A, it's not a view that many people share, um, and B, it's not straightforward to sort of say what the justification is, but... Um, uh, okay, then, what's your view on logic? Where does it belong? I would say my, my own view is more or less the view that, um, that was held by both Quine and Mill, which is that mathematics, for instance, is, a, is, a, is an empirical science, uh, and is empirically justified, justified by appeal to experience. Um, and... Quine, this is the American philosopher W. V. Quine, who, who um, flourished in the mid 20th century. Um, he also held the same of logic, so he thought that logic itself is something that's empirically justified. So he had a completely thoroughgoing uh, empiricism, 
Um, but I would add that he wasn't a materialist in the sense of thinking that everything is a material object. He believed in, in what we call abstract objects, and he thought that was the best explanation of, of what numbers are, for instance. Um, so you can combine those views and still be an empiricist um, if you are as sophisticated about it as Quine was. And I, I find his view probably the most congenial. And I think you have just demonstrated why philosophy is still necessary because it's exactly to talk about these kind of questions and understand them. Well, these are very difficult questions, and I think I don't think it's necessary for everyone. I think there are some people who can perfectly, perfectly, properly, and happily get through life without caring about these things. But there are some people who care and who want to know the answers. Um, and I'm very glad that such people exist. <laughs> yeah, and now if, if we if we go back to um, because we started talking about this, about the Kalam and, and cosmology and all these different arguments. Um, a lot of this talk is about causes. Mm. And one mm. thing that I found interesting when you say um, the, the, the run of the mill impression is if you play hide and seek, you should play with somebody who does not know um, where you're going to hide. Mm. And you're saying, no, 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 it's actually quite the other way around. And I agree with you. And I'd love you to, to explain this to people. I see. Okay. Well, that that particular paper, um, uh, in a way, requires a certain kind of context. But I'll, I'll just briefly say a bit about the context. Um, there is a way of thinking about. There are two sort of ways of thinking about how we ought to make decisions. And one way of in, in a very abstract classification. Um, and on one side of that classification is the view that we should make decisions based on their powers to affect our welfare, so that what they can what they can cause and what they can't cause. And the second view is the view that we should make decisions based on whether they're signs of something good, regardless of whether or not they cause the thing that's good. Uh, so to give you an example, um, uh, a well-known example from the literature concerns, concerns smoking. So supposing it were true, this is in fact false, but supposing it were true that the statistical correlation between smoking and cancer didn't arise because um, uh, smoking caused cancer, but because there was a gene that, on the one hand, predisposed people to, to be addicted to nicotine, and on the other hand, and through an independent route, caused people to, to get this disease. Now, if that was so, there would still be a statistical correlation between the behavior and the, and the um, condition. Um, but nobody would think that just because the behavior is a sign of the condition, it's what brings about the condition. And in that situation, you might think that there's a there's a payoff to smoking. You know, you might as well smoke because it's not going to make any difference to whether you've got the condition. Um, that's one view. The alternative view is that if we're careful about it, we can actually dispense with the notion of, of causality altogether and just think that actually we should only do things that are signs of other things that we want, regardless of whether or not they bring about those things. Well, I myself am attracted to that to that second view, though in the case of the smoking example, I think, I think it needs to be complicated a bit. Um, uh, and part of the reason I'm attracted to that, that second view goes back to the empiricism we discussed earlier, because I think properly empirical view of the universe um, has no place for causation. Causality doesn't appear in fundamental physics. There's, you know, there's, no, there's no causality in the Schrodinger equation. Um, and I think physics tells us what there is, so I don't think there's any causality. Now, all of, that's, all of that's by way of background. Um, let me give you an example of how it makes a difference to people's actual decisions. Um, it's, there's quite a bit of evidence that in elections, when people vote in large elections, for instance, um, they vote, one of the motivations behind their voting is that voting for this or that candidate is a good sign that other people like you will come out and vote for that candidate as well. Nobody's under any, any illusions that it brings about that result, but nevertheless, people do vote in large elections, um, and this is part of the thinking behind it. Um, so that would be an example where people are concerned to make decisions on the basis of evidence rather than on the basis of causality. And it was to the dispute between those two views, I guess, which makes this difference in, in, um, uh, in cephology, that uh, the, the paper was intended to be a contribution. Okay. All right. I can I can relate to that. I can understand that. I'm not quite sure that I would be able to argue this for somebody else, but I think I've grasped it and I see um, the the benefits of this this approach. Um, actually, I, I would like to try this and and see if I can argue this for myself. Mm -hmm. What would you recommend to somebody 
if they were to go and talk to, I mean, we're, we're usually talking here to Muslims, okay, because we are addressing Islam, because there's plenty of channels addressing Hindus and Christians and so on, but hardly anybody who does the same for, for Islam. So if, if we want to help people addressing Muslims, what advice would you give them if you, for example, um, were told, all right, yeah, because there's a cause and the cause of the universe and blah, blah, blah. How would you tell people or what advice would you give them how they can argue against this? Yeah, um, well, I mean, the, the connection that you just drawn to my attention is interesting because I hadn't, I hadn't thought of it in that way at all. And the, 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 that is to say the connection between my own sort of skepticism about the very notion of causality and the Kalam argument, that there is a connection. Um, but I will have to think about that a bit further, so I'll set that aside for the moment. Um, the way I would argue for, the way I would argue against, against that, and perhaps it seems to be the most straightforward and simple way, is simply to deny the assumption that there can be an infinite backward chain of causes. Um, now, Hamza, uh, for instance, and, and other people have said similar things, um, have justified this premise on the grounds that if there was an infinite backwards chain of causes, the thing could never have got started. Yeah, which is true, which also is true with circular. Yeah, I mean, but that seems to me to be false on, on the purely logical grounds that, that um, uh, of course, an infinite backward chain of causes could have got started, um, because uh, if, each, if each cause took half the time of the one that followed it, then the whole thing, that, you know, you would have had an infinite number of events taking place in a finite time. So there need be no difficulty at all in supposing that, that there could be an infinite backward chain of causes any more than there's any logical difficulty in thinking that there's an infinite forward chain of causes. Yeah, and I, always, I also found that um, what, what he does, he says, well, then um, if, if the, what did, what did he say, if the universe were to rely on that, mm. then um, it would never get started. But the thing that he's introducing here is the fact that the universe might not have started if this had happened, but we do have the universe, which means he's actually um, demonstrated his own argument at absurdum, because because he says, well, if, if there's no God, then we can't have a universe, but we have a universe, that means there's no God. So I can turn this um, around on it. Well, no, that's, I mean, that, that's, that's the converse of the thing. I mean, it's true, if there's, if, uh, if there's no God, then there's no universe. It doesn't follow that... Um, uh, there's a universe, therefore there's no God. If, if there's no God, then there's no universe. That conditional, I think, is is, is wrong. Um, but in itself, it doesn't refute. I don't think that refutes his position. Um, I think you just have to argue against the truth of that of that conditional. Um, okay. It does seem to me to be false for the reasons that you stated. Um, I mean, another way to see it would just be to think in 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 terms of Newton's Newton's mechanics. Even Newton's mechanics allows for an infinite chain of backwards. Um, yeah, I don't have a problem with that either. I don't know why he thinks this is such a uh, like a like a de instant death argument. I have no idea why he does that. Yeah. So this is this is this uh, you know, this this argument, the class argument, has been around for a long time, um, and its continued appeal, in a way, somewhat baffles me. Um, so my answer, I agree. <laughs> so in a way, my answer to your question might not be a very good one because um, it may be that there's some sort of deep rooted psychological attraction that people feel towards it that couldn't just be dislodged by means of argument. Um, perhaps the best way to combat combat religion, you know, is is in the end not just by argument, but through emotional appeals of one sort or another. But that's a different question. Okay, what what would you, if you were still a Muslim, what would your philosophical approach be to convince others that you were right? Um, if I was a Muslim, <laughs> that's an interesting question. Um, well, I suppose it would depend on why I was a Muslim. In the first place, so this is what, how I would convert other people to the religion. Is that is that the question? Correct. If you if you were in Hamza's shoes, you would be a professional Muslim because I mean this is his job, all right? He doesn't sell washing machines; he sells Islam. How would you sell Islam on a, on a philosophical basis? Um, I think probably I would I would try to give. Argument. I think the best argument that there is, I and mean, I don't think the argument works, but the best argument that there is for broadly um, uh, religious conclusions is some version of the argument from design, so the argument, the, the teleological argument, that the world seems to be designed for life, and that that, are, that that situation could not have arisen had there not been some intelligent design in the background. Um, that might have I find that such a weak argument. 
Well, I mean, all, none of the arguments work, so in a way, it's, it's a hard choice. <laughs> okay. um, but I think I think some of the straightforward objections to that argument are not as uh, are not successful. Um, for instance, there's the reply, which is the so-called anthropic principle, which says, "Well, look, we're here, so it shouldn't be surprising that the universe was was um, has has conditions which are such as to support life." Well, that's perfectly true that we're here. But now think about the following analogy. I mean, imagine that um, imagine that you were facing a firing squad, um, you know, with say a thousand soldiers or a million soldiers all pointing a gun at you, each one pointing a gun at you, and each gun had a chance of one in twenty of jamming on this occasion. And the rule is that if any of them shoot you, then you you you'll die. Um, but if all of their guns jam at once, then you'll survive. Um, so now imagine that you face the firing squad, um, all the guns do jam, and you survive. Um, it would be a very natural and I think correct response to say, well, that's extremely unlikely that I'm here. Um, something must have happened to bring it about that I'm here. And it wouldn't be any good to reply to that by using this anthropic principle that, well, that you are here, so of course something happened to bring it about that you're here, and you shouldn't find it very surprising. That um, uh, that seems to me to be a weak response in this case, and it seems to me also to be a weak response in the case of the um, of the teleological argument, or at least the version that involves cosmic fine tuning, not the version that that um, uh, Darwinian evolution would have refuted. So that's one reason why I think the argument is a little bit stronger than people people presented as being. And I still think it's a total failure, but I think that it doesn't fail for that reason. Okay, my approach in this is different. That I say we, we, there is no design because we fluctuate. The Earth fluctuates by five million kilometers in its orbit around the Sun. We have sat, we have we have um, asteroids, we have meteors, we have all sorts of stuff floating around, which which are killing each other. We have suns exploding. We have yeah. all sorts of things going wrong in the universe. And then on top of everything, I use the poker game. Um, as my per, my personal model, where I say at the end of the evening, somebody who's played like sixty games of poker and won all of them to be the winner of the poker tournament, the last card sequence of cards that he got, the the, the winning deck, is yeah. only one view out of sixty. And if I now calculate in reverse all the options that he might have had on instead of the one that you actually got. I'm then using huge numbers, yeah. which is what um, apologists love so much. Um, at the same time, I'm showing that it's very, very natural that these things happen just like that. Now, if I calculate the odds for each of the cards that he has, has had in those 60 games, um, it's humongous, and yet at the end of the day, he is the winner, and therefore there is no design or planning or design necessary. Yeah, no, no, that's right. No, sorry, um, Sorry, uh, relating to the, I agree with uh, stop here because relating to the shooter argument, we we also have to imagine, according to recent physics, that there's also infinite amount of this situation happening. So this this situation is happening many 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 times. So probably ninety nine percent of them kill the person, but that one percent. So you know you know what I'm saying. So we have to look at it like um, stop is looking at it. As when you look at it from the other way, it looks impossible. But yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. So, yeah, I think there's a couple of things about that. I mean, one thing is that, and I think the multiverse hypothesis, if that's what you have in mind, is is a very or, or some versions of it because there's yeah. so many versions. Yeah. Yeah, you see, I mean, I think that that's a very extravagant hypothesis. I wouldn't want to rely on that in arguing against something like something like this. On the other hand, I do think. Um, Something like you know, something similar to what you said would work against the Kalam argument because there certainly are models of the universe where it oscillates so that time does go on backwards forever. Um, there's no a priori uh, reason why time shouldn't go on backwards forever, so it would refute that argument. But in connection with this argument, I wouldn't want to re rely on the existence of a multiverse um, in order to make the argument work. Um, I mean, I think I think the reason the argument works is simply that no nobody has ever given any justification for thinking. That it was unlikely that this thing couldn't have arisen by chance. That all depends on a prior distribution of, of probabilities over the um, over the possible values the physical constants should take. Um, and there's never been any reason to think that there's a uniform distribution on the way that we measure those things. Yeah, and of course, I've, the killer, killer question is well, show, demonstrate a universe without design and then compare it. Yeah, exactly. We don't have one. Um, if, if, you know, if there were billions of universes without design, 
um, that that might show something, but we don't have we don't have such universes. And of course, if if some such did exist, then it would hardly be surprising that there's one in which life is uh, life is supported. I mean, I'm, I personally think, personally, I mean, my opinion really just is based off of what I've been seeing. Scientists have been saying is they think that we're going to find some form of life pretty soon within the next 10, 20 years, some form of, because they're like, you know, there's 16 or 17 possible places with water, even in our own solar system, and that is just so many, I thought there was like one or two, so I'm sure we'll find something, and then the argument will change, but I personally, if I was going to uh, bring out or sell Islam, I would not use any kind of, it depends on who you're arguing against. If, if I'm arguing against someone who uses logic, you're not going to win with logic because it's obviously wrong. So I would use the uh, emotional aspect and say, look how it makes you feel good because this is the only way that we are, you're going to be able to change someone. And so I think that's their best argument is this is going to be good for your uh, well-being mentally and kind of like Buddhists, you know. And so I think that's the best argument. We can't even consider a logical argument because they're ridiculous. You know, we're imagining the least of which. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Of course, the trouble with that is that there's a danger that if it turned out other religions were going to make you happier than being Islamic would, um, then the person would go for those religions rather than, rather than for Islam. Um, so that argument can be kind of double-edged, I guess. But then, like you said, Islam has changed so much. You could probably find something that can suit everyone. You know, if, if, if you, you, you want to sleep around, there's muta. If you want to do this, there's other things. You know, I can <laughs> think of different things, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's flexibility in that respect might be some kind of selling point. I'm afraid I should have to go shortly. I was uh, going to say, is, is there anything that you would like to ask and um, before that... Um, I say thank you for the time that you have uh, spent here with us. Uh, no, I think you've covered. We've covered all of the things that I wanted to um, that I wanted to bring up. But I did want to thank you for being uh, for inviting me on the show and say I do, do appreciate um, the work that you do. I think your shows are terrific. Um, so keep it up. Thank you. Well, I think we're the only English-speaking uh, well show call it show uh, addressing Islam. I don't. I have not heard of anybody else uh, doing that. The, can I ask you for one last thing, just one sentence, because I was so fascinated by this. The way that you got out of this this um, short sequence that you have, how you managed to, persu to persuade yourself that there was no God. Um, well, I think that was, that was more a matter of, of general education, that is to say. I went through the sort of learning process that, that, that you know, people do go through in Western countries and learn about things like science and um, uh, logic and also learned that religious people don't have a monopoly on virtue. I learned about the variety of religions um, uh, and it soon became clear to me, just as it became clear that, that you know, all of these other things like the Tooth Fairy and Father Christmas and so on don't exist, it became to be just as clear that these things, um, you know, these things are all made up as well. And But not only made up, but also made up for probably political ends and ends to, to dominate other people. Um, so it became quite clear to me from, from early adolescence, I would say, that, that all religions were, were nonsense. And I've never really deviated from that view. The only surprise to me is that so many people haven't. Yeah, that's the thing. It's, it's, a, it's a matter of growing up, and I'm always surprised that other people don't grow up, that they manage to persuade themselves that Santa Claus doesn't exist, or the Tooth Fairy, or, I don't know, Easter Bunny, and then they stop, <laughs> instead of just carrying on. Yeah, okay, but, Dr. Ahmed. They think they're hearing the same thing about all the other religions, so they also they <laughs> have the same passion as you do about the other religions, but for some reason... Well, this is the benefit or the advantage that I had, because I grew up in a Christian family um, mm -hmm. going to school in Iran. And so I got two gods at the same time, and I thought, whoa, what's up here? They can't both be right. And even as a kid, I realized there's something wrong here. And so at the age of 12, I'm, I was actually waiting for the bolt of lightning to hit me when I was thinking with her thoughts. <laughs> but that's, that's the way it works, yeah. Good. I'm, well, I'm glad to hear that. Well, thank you very much. No, Dr. Thanks, Thanks, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for, for spending time here and explaining this. And um, this was incredibly in, 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 well, insightful. And um, it was brilliant to have you here personally. Thank you much for very much for your time. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks. Good talking to you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. -bye. Okay. <clears throat>
That was brilliant. That well, was nice. That was a good hour. I actually, the thing is, I always, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of wavering. Do, do we, do we really need philosophy? Is, is what role does philosophy still play in today's environment? And, and I'm always going. Well, actually, yeah, we still need it because there are still open questions which need to be discussed, and it's important, and blah, blah, blah. And then a week later, I think. Nah, not really. There's nothing new. Than it. And then next week, I think again, well, actually, well, here's an example, and here we need it. So I'm always going backwards and forwards on this. So it's very good to have somebody who's an expert on this who could actually explain this. So, yeah. I think, I mean, speaking of which, if you want to continue on this topic, um, I think, of course, we need philosophy. Philosophy is the answer to every question that we have every day that doesn't get solved with a calculator. Well, no, because if you talk about the design argument, for example, you don't need philosophy. What do you mean? Like, well, if somebody if comes and says, well, it's obvious that God exists, otherwise we wouldn't have a planet Earth, because everything needs to be designed. It cannot happen by mere chance. You know what the LDM guys are saying. Okay, and what are you saying, they don't have a philosophy? No, this is bullshit. This is just, this is just sheer ignorance. I can, I, mean, I can take a calculator and I can tell you that if, if we take the Big Bang and, and, and we go from there, we, we take the, the hot state and then it cools down and then we have photons and then we gradually go into the, into the atoms where we have the subatomic particles are forming into, into sort of bonds and then you get the first molecules and then you get the first condensation and then blah, blah, blah. And, and you, you, you can just argue it bit by bit by bit. Um, and so you no philosophy fits there? All this random process will eventually result in having stars and eventually having a planet Earth. So, right, but you, so you're saying there's no need for philosophy in that? There's no need for philosophy in that. Yeah, but the thing is philosophy is for not for rocks. You know, it's for... Exactly. It's for that's what I'm saying. No, 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 that's exactly what I'm saying. So if you take the design argument, you don't need philosophy. Yeah, you know, I personally think that philosophy is what religion should be and what it is failing to be, you know. Exactly. Okay, here, yeah, perfectly. Perfectly, 100% d'accord. That This I'm not going to contest. Absolutely. Because we all need a direction to, you know, how do you live? Do you, do you, what's better? I mean, here's a question for you. I just read a quote from, uh, what's that, Dalai Lama guy. And it, it, it just makes sense, you know, we, 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 sacrifice our health to make money and then we sacrifice the wealth that we made to recuperate re re recuperate our health and I don't because I'm one of the people who I don't have stress uh -huh. so you're not so you're saying you don't go for the money well of course I go for the money but not at all cost like for example I ditched um, Kabul when because I said to myself the chances of getting killed are not worth any amount of money because there's no point in getting killed when, when you have money. So I well, exactly. I, That's I it. putting philosophy in. I mean, I exactly. it. it was not a, a matter of philosophy. I, this is a, a calculation. What are the odds of getting killed? What are the odds of having the money? So I just said, okay. no, fuck this, bye-bye, cheers. There's harder questions. I mean, look where religion is coming in. Where is religion coming in? It's coming in in, in terms of answering questions about abortion. It's coming in... No, okay. it's not answering any questions. No, 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 that's where they want to use it. You know, religion never comes in into anyone's life except when they're trying to answer these large questions to have to, having to do with social policy, you know. No, that's no, where, no, I mean, it's where else do you... an ego. People have religion because they have an ego problem and they need a crutch. Okay, why else would people deny abortion if it's not for religion? I don't know, because they see it as a baby, because they have an emotional attachment to this. Right, and so that's their philosophy. Do you know what do you, do you, no, do you see? What they I'm see saying? it as, no, 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 they see it as a mixture of cells which already resembles a baby. They don't see it as cells, but as a, as a baby. And now right. emotion comes in. This is not philosophy or anything. This is just that a, a grouping of cells has a different label. No, it I just think that it is. their emotions come from their philosophy of, based on, you know, whatever religion they have and how life is so... Uh, because you have to realize... Is this atheists this who is, don't want abortion? There's very little atheists who don't like abortion here. I don't know about how the whole thing is in 
England because you guys have a lot more atheists than we do in America, apparently. Well, I but, know atheists who are not in favor of abortions. What about, like, um, stem cell research? Things like this. Okay, or, this is, this or, is or, example. Or, Where is or, the limit? This is what you need to discuss, and there you need philosophy. But I'm saying for the design argument, and not everywhere, do you need philosophy? Just for the design argument. Well, I guess okay. not. Should, should I think of more things? I think, I don't know, I think we're talking about the two different things here. Because uh, I seem to agree with you, but yet... Uh, well, I have the same feeling. <laughs> but it's not that... Um, I, I would say that it's my philosophy um, to go and decide whether or not I should, um, you know, agree to abortion or not. I don't think it's abortion. It's a matter of labeling it correctly and saying, okay, as from which point onwards is an amassment of cells considered to be... Li live worthy, no life worthy. No, okay, living worthy. Okay, How do you okay. call that? Life worthy, live yeah, worthy. Uh, okay, living. Let's just Alive. say I, I, I'll give you this. This is actually a. This is actually something that I believe. I, I think abortion should be something that should be left to science. We can realize when the consciousness comes in and when it becomes a thing. We should just leave it no, up to that. We should, we should leave it to the woman who is pregnant, whether she can handle it or not. No, I mean, if she, okay, let's just say she wants to. What time is best? At ah, okay, okay, okay. okay. I'm not going into the specifics. I'm, I'm, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I'm just saying there's some questions that really don't answer like that. What I'm thinking is uh, just there's questions like for, for crime, for uh, do you kill someone who did something and is crazy? You know, do you, you know what I'm saying? There's questions that you can't just answer with. No, 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 you're right. Because, so, you know, and that's, for example, an autistic child. Do you kill an autistic uh, baby? Okay, yeah, that's one. That, that's or when I, you start... Something even simple, like your relationship. How do I go at it? Do I get married? Do I... I mean, I guess you can... No, 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 they all agree with you, 100%. Yeah, Absolutely. yeah. And so that's why I think there definitely is a place for philosophy but everywhere. We just... Yeah, but there's nothing new there. Yeah, yeah. I was going to ask our guest about what he thinks about this new... Um, there's this New Age philosophy coming up from, uh, like, there's a lot of New Age philosophies that are kind of like, you know, Deepak Chopra or whatever, you know what I'm saying, like, crazy mixtures. But there's actually some scientific philosophy coming forward with, it's based on materialism, it's kind of interesting. Where, uh, you know, Krauss, the, uh, he's a the famous physicist. astrophysicist, yeah. He um, talks about some of this stuff, and he's like, you can you can make science into a philosophy by okay. yeah, and 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 this is again goes back to one part of the argument about the guests, which I didn't. Well, I went, I was I was gone, and then I came back. I don't know if I understood the premise of his argument, but he was saying that there's two parts to um, there's two different aspects of causation way of looking at it. And he didn't agree with the first one, but he he, he agreed with the second part. Do you remember uh, this that? This is his part? last paper, because he he wrote a paper which fascinated me, which is the the causal and evidential. Is, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When he says that, there's one that you look at the effect of what you do. So he his first example was the cigarette smoking and then going into the genes. Yeah, because how do you take decisions, okay? Do you take decisions based on a cause or do you take decisions based on the evidence? And there he says, no, 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 the, the causal thing might get you, and this is the, the um, analogy that he created, might get you, get you to actually say, no, smoking is good for you. Mm. Evidential decision theory gets you to come to the, the correct conclusion and, and and therefore stop smoking. Yeah, yeah, okay. This is the so whole point, and, and I find this, for example, he says, playing hide and seek with somebody who knows where you are going to, um, where you're going to hide is more difficult than the other way around. And th this, is, this is unintuitive, because if you have somebody who does not know where you're going to hide, it should be easier to hide from them. But in actual fact, it's the other way around, because if somebody knows where you're going to hide, you can easily circumvent that and hide somewhere where they will not know where to look for you. So in actual fact, it makes it easier. 
but you know it's, it's not intuitive so you need to think about these things and I thought hey this is a nice idea um, and this is what he explained right um, I wonder how, you know I wish we would have gotten more into it because where would the arguments we had on the other episode about causation fit into this so he's saying you look at the the after effects correct inside yeah yeah I totally agree with that and exactly this is yeah. the thing. well I was very happy that she spent more than half an hour with us I'm, I'm, I'm quite, uh, quite yeah I'm, I'm, I'm very thing. surprised that you were people. able to get this people personally yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm congratulations man you are some kind of magician well, for being able I, to no 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 no, no. I've, I've contacted Professor Hoyland because I want him as well do you know Robert Hoyland uh, Tom Holland? Is that what you're talking about? He is, he's the guy who, who does all the research on Islam and, and he is the the current leading um, whatever on, on Islam. And he just brought out a book which I'd love to talk to him about. Um, but he has not come back to me yet. Because I think it's nice to have people like... Because Klingshaw was also saying, yeah, I'll get Patricia Croner, I'll get Fred Donner, I get all these people on here. But he never did. So um, maybe it's time to, to take the initiative and, and have some more guests. Because we used to do that. Um, I used to run around like every week and I used to write people, uh, write emails to people and saying, listen, why don't you come on the show and blah, blah, blah. So I got a lot of people on there, but um, then I stopped because it's a lot of work. Anyway. Yeah. Um, I have opened up the chat, so if anybody refreshes the comments, um, they can join. Uh, if anybody has a question, if anybody has a comment, if anybody has a remark or anything, um, this is the Gin and Tonic Show. We are here not only as a lecturing platform, we enjoy the interaction with people, especially with, with Muslims, with apologists, because we'd like to understand why people believe what they believe. And we are there to provide information on why we think this is not the case. So it, this is always nice to have a debate, and well, not a debate, but at least have a conversation about it. So if you want to join, um, either go to the links that, oh, I forgot to give this to Ike. Um, OK, here's the link to Ike, because Ike is somebody who, who watches and who then provides links to our Hangout, uh, where if you want, because it's a lot quicker, because normally what you'd have to do is you'd have to go to YouTube, you have to go to the Gin and Tonic Show, you have to click on the channel, you have to click on About, and then in About you have to click on Live, and only then do you see the comments. And only then do you see the actual link where you can join us. What he does is much easier. You just go to godless.ch. And then in front of the godless.ch, you have two options. Either live, in other words, you just watch and listen and see what we're doing. Or you hang out, in other words, you join us. So it's a lot easier just to go to godless.ch. And in front of godless.ch, you just put either live or hang out. And that's it. And then you can either watch or participate. Okay, where were we? Um, you were explaining the um, I Okay, I think, uh, uh, can I just bring up something I thought that was very interesting from what the guest said? Okay, yeah, yeah sure, sure, sure. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, he, he, he came up with a part which I've been kind of coming to. It's always made sense to me, but I don't see it in a way, is how diverse Islam is. But it all it, 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 it I've been coming to this, and maybe we could talk about it right now. Compared to for let, let's say Christianity or oh no, Christianity has thirty three or so thirty six thousand different um, areas of Christianity. Right, right, right. But they're all you know how they have a name and and they're all ordered. I know so many Muslims that don't follow anything, and they have they have no similarities with, with each other. But they oh, all just okay. call themselves. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So there's nothing to label them, but yet Christians, I can tell you that I know, okay, all of these Christians, they will accept Jesus as, 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 as God. No, no, yeah. no, 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 no. Oh, really? Not everybody, see, no, no, no. Some see him only as a savior, as a, as a man God, um, somebody who was sent by the God, very similar to a prophet, who was then maybe even raised um, next to God or something, but he was not a God himself. Like a demigod, so it's a different thing than. Okay, so I guess I've been uh, treated to Central Americana 
Protestantism. I'm not really sure too much. I don't know too much about Christianity. But for me, I just... The Bible doesn't say so. And this is what, what people then say. The Bible doesn't say that he was a god, so why should we think he's a god? It doesn't say that... I guess you're right. It doesn't really quote Jesus. Okay, so I'm still asking the same question. Does a man in heaven get to keep a circumcised penis or not? How, how does that work? Oh, yes, yes. Um, Back to the important things. The, the really important things. And... Um, what, what, and in South Africa, they've got a they've, they've got a solution because they actually managed to put back an amputated penis. So somebody had a circumcision; it went wrong. They had to cut it off, otherwise he would have died. Then they found a dead person, took off his penis, and put it on the living man's uh, whatever place. And they managed to join this so well that it works. Well, what happens when he goes to heaven? Does 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 he get his old one back, the the broken one? And would it be circumcised, or is if during the circumcision it went wrong, he gets gets to keep his uncircumcised one? How does that work? How does this whole donor and and blah 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 resurrection mechanism work in heaven? Hold on, hold on. I want to know how it works when you take a dead guy's dick and then make it work again. That's more interesting. Hold on. <laughs> So they so they took a dead guy's penis and then they put it on him and it worked. Yeah. Wow. Did he get like a choice? Did, did they like show him a variety of dead guys and say which one do you want or what's what, going what on? What size would it be today for you, sir? <laughs> wow, this is crazy. Where are we going? <laughs> yeah, they managed to do that, and um, this then prompted all the other questions um, that I had. So I thought this was quite interesting. Anyway. Let's yeah, I mean, that's a good question because they always say you're going to find the best uh, thing and with the best whatever you want. So what happens to the wife and the, and, the, and, the, and the man? Do they get married or does he get to have what he wants on the side? And does she see? Is she okay? Does she get more than one husband? You know, so all these questions about heaven make no sense whatsoever. No. Yeah. Just... And then, well, okay, while on the topic, I made a, a comment here. Do you, do you know what a Y chromosome female is? Like a female that's actually a man? Well, yes and no. Um, because the basic form is the female form, okay? It's not like in the Quran and the Bible. They're wrong, okay? Um, because they say that the man is first and then... Oh, yeah, and then it the turns other. into a man after... Yeah, okay. Okay, actually, in, in nature, it's the opposite way around, all right? So no, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Female, and then what happens is because you have a Y chromosome, you have a set of um, SRD. Okay, I'm not going to go into detail how, how this whole works and how the, the Wolfian ducts and everything... Um, what, what happens is you, you have a couple of hormones which then decide whether you're going to have a female, in other words, whether these um, are going to be ovaries and whether it's going to be a womb or whether they're going to be testicles and it's going to be outside and the tubes, how everything gets connected, is governed by those hormones. Now, mm -hmm. if this does not fire, what happens is that this woman stays a woman, but she has y, a Y chromosome. So she's actually a man. Well, how, wait, how does that work with... Because a woman brings in the double X's, right? Well, no, she can't. She doesn't, she doesn't have... She can't menstruate. She can't... You know, the ovaries doesn't... No, no, no. I'm saying a normal woman. A normal woman brings in the X and the X, and then the, the man brings in the X and the Y, right? Yeah. And, and so this is a woman that has a Y in it from the dad's side? Yep. But the outside okay. shape and everything, she remains so a woman. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. So what happens to her in heaven? Yeah, yeah. I mean, what the fuck happens to conjoined twins in heaven? It seems you like know? It. What happens to somebody who is a schizo, where one half is Muslim, the other half is atheist? <laughs> I want to see one of those things. That would be hilarious. Or the other half is a <laughs> Rastafari, and so one half is Rastafari, and the other or half... Or one, one half is Shia, one half is Sunni. <laughs> <laughs> they blow each other up inside the... And then, you know, he wakes up, he's got cuts on himself. What the fuck? <laughs> 
Alasa, are you just testing or are you here to actually contribute something? I'm here to contribute this time. I had to do something. Go. But I got I got I, I didn't ask one of your questions when you said uh, something about applying logic or something. Yeah. I didn't understand the question. Could you tell me? He's still posting. Well, what is logics? Um, is 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 logics dependent on consciousness or is logics dependent on um, em empirical sequences? Well, you know, I I I don't think. It's either way. I mean, uh, for example, uh, two lines uh, that run parallel, would they ever meet? Uh, it's a logical question. Well, it's also an empirical one. Well, yeah, but the, the answer lies uh, no. It's an obvious answer, no. Why is it obvious? I, I don't think you'll, you can ever produce uh, evidence to prove. Well, of course you can. How can, how can if the distance from infinity minus 1 does not change, how should that change between infinity minus 1 and infinity? Well, that's why I said it's, uh, it's a neither. Uh, okay, this is exactly opinion. why I asked, because I'm not quite sure where logics belong. Do, do they belong into conceptual um, thinking? Or is this something that you can measure every single time? And this is why I asked if, if there is a preconceived uh, solution or if this is individual. Well, the, the logical answers are always obvious. Well, not really. Well, then they're but really the logic obvious. means different things to different people also. Does it or no? Can you have something no, that's... No, 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 never. It's, it's always objective. If, if, if I think that if, if you have a case where it's always the same and no one can disagree, it sounds like something like math or... That's, that's so logical, yeah. That would be logic. Now, reason can mean different to different people. So is rationale. But not logic. It's always the same. Hmm. So I guess logic would be... Uh, Stop asking around, Jeremy. What? <laughs> He's playing around with the buttons. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um. Yeah. Uh. Where were we? Anyway, but uh, we should bring it back to uh. I think what's been going on around the world, don't you think? Some news. Yeah, well, now we've got Jeremy here. Now we we need to talk to him. Come on. <laughs> He says, I'm not here to talk, but I can't see comments without joining the Hangout. Unless he wants to talk, in which case, talk on. He doesn't want to do any can't see comments. There's no comments. What, what is... <laughs> oh, you guys are so funny. Okay, are we going to continue now with logics, or are we going to continue with the news? I think we should... I don't know, whatever you think, but I, I was just saying there's so much going on around that maybe we should mention, you know? Okay, what I'd like to mention is that we have more courageous Muslim jihadists who continue their attacks on the heavily fortified and dangerous targets like hotels and offices and cafes. And now what they did is they attacked tourists at a museum in Tunis. You know, all these these hyper dangerous situations and they I mean what the fuck they indiscriminately shoot at unarmed civilians and then quickly run away what, what is that why why would anybody go and shoot tourists and tourists why what well, is that going to cause I mean it's only going to lower the esteem that people already have of, of, of violent Muslims well that has a specific geopolitical reason why they did that. It was very smart, actually. But it goes against their view about, you know, we only kill people who have been attacking us because all they killed was, like, Spanish people and some, you know, only one Tunisian was killed. Yeah, but why, go, oh, why go into Tunis? With, because, well, first of all, first of all, it's... It's because Tunis right now is the only one which has a secular 
quote unquote kind of democracy going on, working it with an just Islamic stabilizing. Faction. Well, yeah, exactly. They they don't want it to stabilize. You have to realize the number one country that sends fighters to the Middle East for jihad is Tunisia. Then it's Saudi Arabia, and Tunisia's number one uh, income comes from tourism. That's the number one income. That's the whole life and blood of Tunisia. And if they stop t tourism, just two more bombs, and I promise no one will go to Tunisia anymore. Yeah, but this is stupid. And that'll completely oh, and, throw the but, government but, but, out. Jeremy, I don't understand. The old chat box, I mean, the old way of commenting is still in, is, is still available on YouTube. Because he says, I want that old chat box on YouTube. It's still there. Yeah. So I don't know why... Um, I, I don't quite understand this. I have a problem accessing it, but I seem to be the only one who can't, um, you know, like refresh the view, and that is it. But otherwise, then, that, oh, hang on, there's a message now. This web page is not available. The web page YouTube.com Gin and Tonic Show might be temporarily down, or it might have moved permanently to a new web address. <laughs> oh, you guys are so funny. I'm telling you, th there is a online jihad. Waged against us. Yeah, <laughs> this is so funny. Yes, is... oh goodness. Anyway, so I, I I don't quite understand. Is this only about terrorism? Is that all they want to do? Is that just the aim and the goal now to pro to to um, go into global terrorism? Terrorism is only a tool, though. You know, you have to realize they're very smart in how they do it. They use terrorism as a tool. I don't even, I, I was listening to a, uh, I can't even remember the name, but it was some guy in one of these talks that I sent you. Um, he, he says, you can't even say ISIS is a terrorist anymore because a terrorist doesn't have land. These guys have land, but they use terrorism as a tool. So we have to treat them as, you can't just say they're terrorists because that makes them a, as a lesser of a threat, I think, than if you say they're... No, I think they are terrorists because this is. I mean, they use terrorism. Happening. A terrorist is somebody who attacks people who have nothing to do with him uh, to get to get some result, which has nothing to do with the people that he killed. I mean, <laughs> you could argue that with so many things. You know, some guy's terrorist is another guy's freedom fighter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, but but yeah. what what is happening is that how can you go inside a mosque? And then blow yourself up. In Yemen, are you saying? The one in, in Yemen? In, in Yemen. And then when the people go outside and the ambulances arrive, the helpers and fire brigade right. and everybody, then they blow up the car they parked outside, blowing up everybody else. Yeah. I mean, how... I mean, how... Uh, no, I, can't, I cannot... Work, this is I cannot yeah. fathom this. How, how much of a... Uh, you cannot be human to, to think out something like this. Well, it was claimed by the Islamic State again. I don't want to. But how? I mean, I don't want to go back into what their ideology is because we went into it the whole two seasons ago or two. Yes, episodes. but how can anybody be so callous? How can anybody be so brutal, so sadistic? But then, how can people in you know the same thing happened in China during the Cultural Revolution? Do you know how many people they killed? You know, people are animals, man. People okay. are. I have I've lost all hope after seeing so many things to their own people. This is ridiculous. No, but when I see this, when I read this, I I, I, I cannot believe this. For me, this is this is so sick. This is so. And you know, it's only going worse and worse. And then Israel. Or the next next thing I have is the letter to Iran by some I mean forty seven some U.S. senators. Oh yeah. Who the fuck do they think they are? I mean, Who that's the not fuck even an issue. Does the United States think they are allowed to bomb just because they feel like it? You know, the bombing is a different question. I don't even have a problem as long as they're just trying to stop it. You know, they're just trying to stop the negotiations and exactly to bomb, and that is the worst option. But anyway, but let, let, what was I saying earlier? Uh, Netanyahu just won somehow. And, you know, he says that he's not going to go for a Palestinian state. Palestinian and what? Palestinian state. What is that? <laughs> I'm joking. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. There is no... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just let him finish the, the sentence. And um, uh, you can already see the intifada boiling up. I mean, just a few days ago, a few 
they were ki some Israelis were killed. Every other day, you see someone getting knifed somewhere in some bus or running over by some Palestinian. And and, and even in the settlements, you see Palestinians getting killed by uh, P Jews in the settlements. Okay, you know, Hogsy, what is a Palestinian? No, um, no, I was just joking about. I was just playing as a <laughs> pro-Israelian. <laughs> Okay, but what is a Palestinian? I don't know. Or someone, a an Arab who lived in the area. In that region, yeah. yeah. Like, is that a black forestian? <laughs> what? A what? Somebody from the black forest. I mean, it's like everything else, man. It's like, <laughs> what is? What's a Bavarian? A Bavarian is someone who lives in Bavar you know, Bavaria. That's exactly the point. But maybe we can uh, look at it. Find borders. There, there are limits to Bavaria, where there isn't to the Black Forest or to Palestine. Well, the, the, that's kind of due to the Jewish expansionism. I mean, there was limits, and then they keep on building more, and so you can't what really. What limits were there? What were the limits of Palestine? There was the 46, and then there was the, when they, you know, when they, when they were started, you know the whole differences, there and then the no war Palestine. came. And... There's never been a Palestine. What do you mean there's never been a Palestine? There's never been a Palestine. I mean, maybe you can do the same argument for Kurdistan. I mean, you there, can. there's never been a Kurdistan. You, you, you can do an argument, I think, for Kurdistan. I mean, honestly. Not for Palestine. Let's not start yeah. talking about Kurdistan now. The, the thing is No, that it's because, you know... We, uh, there just, is a just, land. I just made a comparison with Arabs. Arabs. It's filled yeah. with these Arabs who f view themselves as Palestinians. Yeah. And they've hey, been there well. for as long as anyone else has been there. Yeah, but this is the same is true for the Black Forestians. Why do you keep bringing up the Black Forestians? <laughs> yes, they're stupid. So you're saying that they have no right to call themselves a country? No. Well. Well, if the Black Forestrians were maybe filled with people from China, let's just say a bunch of Chinese people bought a bunch of land, and then they started moving in a bunch of Chinese people, and then later claiming their own country, I think the Black Forestrians could claim, could have some claim to something. You well, can't just deny country. complete everything just because they've been eradicated some 40 years ago, or not 40 years ago. Seventy years ago, you can't just say that they there didn't exist. Are. Seventy years ago, it's like saying Syrians didn't exist because they were part of the Ottoman Empire. It's like saying, you know, what do you mean they didn't exist? <laughs> there's been they a have Syria, their own there's been a Palestine. There's always been a Palestine in every old map I've seen. No, you show me a map with Palestine on it that doesn't exist. Are you serious? No point. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm you serious. Mean, okay, I will. Okay, not for now. But I will show you a map that says Palestine on it. Okay. Even from Roman times. Come no. on. There's been Syria North and Syria South. Um, it, and it was the Philistines that were that appeared on the map. And then there was only... Okay, I must take back the word. There was one map which existed only once and for a couple of months, which actually said Palestine on it. But this was not a real border. This was just... The writing um, in, in, in the area which was going somewhere between Gaza to Jordan. Well, it's kind and of saying there's no Arabia because there was never set boundaries in some map. There is groups of people who lived in this area, and throughout time, they were, because pe other people called them that probably, they began to know themselves as the Philistines. Now, is it the people that came first, or is it the name that was given to them by the ruler? I think it was... Rome that started no, using that's not that. The point. the point what I'm making is that, of course, there have been people which call themselves Palestines or Palestinians or Palestinos or doesn't matter what. Okay. But there has never been a country as such. There has never been a region with borders which says, this is Palestine. Exactly. It's been up for debate for 80 years. Exactly. There you are. Not for 80, for, for, for 2,000 years. I'd say 80, but okay. Okay, but anyway. the, the thing is, like, the way that we would claim a state, I, I'm not denying that the Jews are there. They're already there. You can't say that they don't belong there. They've been there. But the same easy way that... Why do you, they belong there? Because they've been there for 80 years. They have their own country. Oh, ah, okay, That's 80 years. Yeah, because don't come to me with this funny, my God gave you my country bullshit. Oh, no, 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 no. Of course not. That, I'm looking at this very from a realistic point of view. 
They've just been there for 80 years. They've established their own country. Live with it. But we can't just deny that this was, you know, it's like kind of saying that, for example, if America was living, you know how America's history is and how they took over and how they bought half of America from the Mexicans, pretty much? Oh, the other half from the Russians, yeah. Well, Ru Russians. Or are you talking about Alaska? Yeah. Yeah. Well, anyway, there's a bunch of... Uh, imagine if there was a huge amount of land, as big as Texas, or, or maybe even bigger than Texas, that only housed the Native Americans that used to live there. And then, you know, and... and, and they think of themselves as still a legitimate country, and then this land keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Some of them have moved into the mainland America, but they still consider themselves as Native American. You can deny that a Native American state ever existed or exists right now, but if there's something as big as, for example, Texas, with its own laws, I'm talking about the West Bank and Gaza, you can't deny that there is a Palestinian. So what is this? So how do they get all these people into this huge amount of land and put walls around them? Where do they come from? Of course there's a Palestine, or there was a Palestine. You know, how, how did you get this land of Gaza and uh, West Bank if there was no such thing as Palestine? I mean, yeah, you know, land of Canaan. Thank you, but I mean, that's an older word for it. Okay, I, I don't know. The, yeah, I don't think there's any solution to this. <laughs> yeah, it really isn't. I think we should just live with what it is. I think yeah. they should just agree with what they have because they, they're never going to agree in peace, right? Okay, Hoxie, do, do you have any anything you want to ask, complain, or do? Uh, no, uh, I just wanted to bring up the... Palestine and Israel conflict, but you guys already did it before I could talk. Oh, okay. You see, but uh, I want to mention that. We call ourselves yeah. prophets. Yeah. <laughs> Alasa, have you finally found the topic that you wanted to address? But, uh, I want to mention ah. that uh, the Israeli lobby uh, does have an effect on American policy. It does not? It does. Oh, okay. Oh, it has a it lot does. of effect. I was just going to say, excuse me. Because, uh, like, uh, Chris Christie, he, uh, in his one of his speech, mentioned about, he, he used the word occupied area, uh, occupied areas. But uh, the next day, he had to make an a, apology for using that word uh, and saying that it was not in, in his intent. <laughs> yeah. 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 It, it's, it's funny. And but he also... Had, and he spoke Sorry, with ahead. some uh, from the Israeli, uh, I don't know what kind of lobby he was, but... Yeah. Oh, there's no denying that APEC is the most powerful, APEC. arguably the most uh, powerful lobby in America, which isn't doing the best for American foreign policy, I might add. A lot of things that Israel really wants to happen aren't the best for America, for example. Isn't there also an evangelicist uh, that supports uh, Israel? Oh, yeah, a huge evangelical branch. Like, uh, I would say that more evangelical Christians support Israel than uh, Jews in America because most of the Jews yeah. are liberal. So they don't even support yeah. a bunch of these. Yeah. But let's let's not forget though because a lot of people always think that the biggest issue in the Middle East is the Arab Palestinian issue or the Palestinian Israeli issue. That is totally not. That has nothing to do with a, most of what's going on right now. And so that's a part that we should mention. It is big. It could have, you know, people ask, why does Iran care about Palestinians so much? We have a, like a chant in Iran. It says, uh, no Palestine, no G uh, Gaza, no Lebanon, just Iran. People don't care about Palestine, you know. They don't care about anything that the government is doing right now. But why are they doing it then? It's all for geopolitical purposes. So people use this Palestinian-Israeli conflict for their own benefit in the Middle East, but it really has no stem. What's going on between the what's going on in Syria really has nothing to do with what's going on between Israel and Palestine. What's, you know, do you know what I'm saying? So yeah, I do. Because a lot of times people start defending the Israeli-Palestinian issue very one-sidedly because people blame that on everything. No, let's look at that separately, but let's look at it fairly. You know, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm not for one side or other. I'm. 
I don't really care about one another. I'm just looking at a neutral standpoint. Okay, Alasa, are you back? Yeah, just just a couple of things. Uh, last week uh, on a forum, uh, there was a study which showed the, that if you give sugar to a premature baby, it helps their uh, brain uh, develop faster. And uh, all of a sudden, they posted uh, the Sunnah of the Prophet, where he used to chew date <coughs> and shove it under the, 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 the two cheeks of the baby. And I made a comment uh, that bad idea, you know, we've got a, germs will ca can cause that or the baby can choke. So <laughs> I was censored out of there. But you, you see these kind of news developing in, in the social media every time there's a study published. Wow. They'll find something to do with Islam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing. I mean, it, and it seems to me that the level of apologetics is going down and is getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah. My f favorite apologetic is the sperm drinker. Daddy sperm <laughs> is what? My favorite apologetic is the daddy sperm drinker. Oh, this this uh, this frog. Um, yeah. da, uh, is it was it Dava Man? Dava Man, exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. What a doer! I mean, that bam, is. Bam bam! It's a Star Wars time. Yeah. <laughs> you <laughs> quite, what? what? So well. Please explain. <laughs> Please explain what. And then don't forget Hadith. I'll just go out and listen now. No, no, no. I'm, I'm doing my job. Come on. I mean, I'm, it, it's been quite um, quite a lot of things happening all at the same time, and suddenly I can't even access the comments anymore. Um, but I have remembered that, and I have done the hadith of the day. Of oh, the week. Go out um, and listen. So, yes. I'm not going to give you the satisfaction, alas, akur, that you can say, nah, 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 nah. Nope. No way, not for me. Anyway, <laughs> actually, I shouldn't open my big mouth because the next time I will forget it and then what? Um, what were you talking? Do you want to know who Dawa Man is or what the reference is to sperm? No, no, yeah, I thought that this little story that he said, I didn't, I didn't hear it very well. But I'm looking at the comments right now to see if there's any new comments, maybe questions. We'll okay, but do you know now who this is and what he did? Not in this instant. I know who Dawa Man is now. Okay, but do you know that he is the idiot who said that atheists have no moral standards and they don't care about anything and this is why they might as well drink daddy's sperm? <laughs> no, I did not know that. He yes. <laughs> and he did this, he made this into a long video showing how a guy creeps downstairs um, in the middle of the night and then opens the fridge, wants something to drink, and, says, and then there's, a, there's a, a cup which says dad's sperm. Now, he doesn't understand that sperm is only the spermatozoon, the, the cell, and um, that the semen is actually the liquid because he's he's really stupid. I mean, this is really the 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 bottom of everything. And don't forget when he uh, uh, when he t uh, talked to uh, what was his name? Kraus. Uh, Kraus. Yeah, how he. That's why I call him the douchebag. Walking around and saying, Professor Kraus, Professor Kraus, Professor Kraus, Professor Kraus, like like a frog. That's that's why I call him the frog. Hey Kraus, drink a daddy spam. Oh, he's so stupid, really. I mean, and the, the thing is that do you know how many followers he has? And do you know that he thinks he's a ladies' man and he gives people advice about all their, um, about all their, their, their relationship problems? And I actually thought he was gay. And apparently he is married. So this is quite, quite strange. And he, he goes up to 14-year-old girls on the street in, in, the, in the UK and tells them, you're not dressed right, you're dressed too sexy. I love your boobs, but I think you're dressed too sexy. I, what an idiot. Anyway, I wish, I wish there was really somebody who, who came up with an original idea, who had some, you know, some, some good stuff. This is why I asked um, Dr. Ahmed, what, what kind of an apologist would he be? What, what would he use? Because the level that I see at the moment is really, really, uh, it's atrocious. Yeah, respectfully. Humbly, I'm saying this. Yeah. S sorry. Sorry, Pete. So Pete? Pete. Who's Pete? <laughs> Rationalizer. Yeah, but that was Andalusi. What are you talking about now? No, 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 it doesn't matter. Oh, okay. Oh, look, I've just had access to the Genotonic page. Wow! 
I can click on done. So it's a matter of time. So I always get the time out. Okay. Um, who else wants to raise something? Nothing. Okay. Then let me go. I have a question. Can anybody tell me why Muslims are so thin skinned? Why is it that if I say Muhammad killed people, that immediately I get a backlash and people are trying to tell me that this is not true, even though it's everywhere in Hadith, every in every every comment, he was in battles, he was in wars, and of course he killed people. Why is it, do you think that Muslims are so thin-skinned that they do not accept this? Maybe it's uh, because they are so programmed that, that when they hear something that they have not been, a, a, I know, been instituted by their parents, they will be you know, immediately free out. I think it's also related to, it's a new thing for let's say, the West, to take on Islam the way they've been doing it recently. You mean and confrontational? So, yeah. Because I, I was thinking, why is it that Daniel Craig is so well-versed in arguing, but then this other guy, who what's his name? Uh, Tariq, whatever. He He's copying Craig's arguments, right? Are you talking about William Lane Craig? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you said Daniel Craig, I thought Daniel Craig is an actor. <laughs> Did I say Daniel Craig? Yeah, I've been watching too much James Bond though. <laughs> I, I don't even watch movies. I don't even know what he looks like right now, Daniel Craig. But okay. <laughs> William, the, the, the Christian apologist. And uh, and I think it's, it's, it's because viewing, you know, Muslims coming and debating on these shows is, is a new phenomenon, my idea. They've been so easily debating within themselves and under that umbrella that you can't really say anything bad about Islam for so long that it's like, you know, Christians are used to people making fun of Christianity, so they just kind of wave it off. You know, you'll, you'll go up to a Christian and, and, you know, bring up all their different arguments and they'll take it very, very well. Like, I've noticed when I talk to Christians, they really don't get offended as much as Muslims do. And I think it's because Muslims aren't used to being confronted like this. And this is a new phenomenon because of the immigration thing, and it's because become, it's become so po political, and because of the whole terrorism, and it's just everything's about the West versus Islam right now in a lot of people's minds. So, you know, that's I think that's... Okay, so you, you're saying they don't have any arguments, and that's why they're panicking? Well, if they are going to form more arguments, yeah, I don't think they have good arguments for the way that atheism is going to debate them, for example. Like Muslims, you can find really good Shia versus Sunni arguments, but when you when you bring an atheist in, the Muslim starts sounding kind of... Uh, he doesn't know how to really respond to this as much as a Christian, for example, who's been attacked like this for a lot more time with open free speech, is, is what I'm saying. Like, you can't have this kind of talk pretty much anywhere in the Middle East. You can't have the debate that they have on TV and having having it go peacefully. No, you can't. But you know, so recently they've been put, putting these things, and so recently we we've, we've been having quote unquote Islamic debate philosophers or whatever debating with uh, atheists, and so they I think they're getting hit with new arguments that they don't know what to say anything about, so they're getting offended. Um, yeah, but the problem on their side is that they're using, reusing the same arguments like uh, oh the universe is so beautiful therefore there's a creator I yeah. hear it all the time and Stupid. it's self evidence there cannot be it cannot be a random chance yeah and then it really bothers me I mean I want to hear something new exactly this is why I think why is it that they, they can't come up with anything and why is it that immediately if you say something immediately you are banned, you are, uh, uh, like, censorship abound, as is the only reaction. And well, as though that makes the problem go away. I don't, you know, I don't understand that. I thought maybe because somebody has an explanation. But I think what, you, what Ara said, that's, that's probably it, yeah. But if you look at some of these, like, when I was researching the Zaydis, or not the Zaydis, the uh, Ismailis, for, uh, you know, like a few months ago, I, I realized how different they are. Like, like I remember if I said that their imam is alive, 
and their imam looks at the religion way different. So this isn't even Islam in some aspects, anything that we know of, right? And um, uh, you can have these kinds of people coming and uh, making rational debate. But because we're debating with the crazy ones right now, the ones that are coming out of that uh, very strict form of Islam, because most of the people who are debating don't debate a Sufi version, right? Yeah. And, and I think that if, if, if they're going to form their argument more towards that lenient Sufi version. So, for example, when a Sufi looks at uh, what, what's going on with a... Uh, you know, when I say Sufi, that's such a broad term. I shouldn't even be using that word. But, you know, there are no words for these kinds of Muslims because, like we talked about earlier, they're not denominated like the Christians are. But you can find Muslims who totally disregard the uh, stoning or totally disregard the punishment for uh, drinking, for example. There's Muslims who think that you can drink to get intoxicated to worship Ali. Okay? There's these Ali worshippers. Okay? So, uh, later on, what I'm trying to get at is p Islamic debaters will start using these kinds of arguments also. Because Christians do not, like if you've noticed, this William Craig guy has a very modernistic view of Christianity that he's debating now. And what? that's what I think Islam is going to get into. But he's only using ancient old stuff, like Kalam. Of course he's using ancient old stuff. That's what their religion is based off of. But his interpretation is different from what you would see a Christian's interpretation would be 100 years ago. I don't think so. You don't think, think so? I've, I've not seen anything from him, no. I mean, this just, is why I think Plantinga, for example, is different because he has a new, he puts a new spin on it, and and Craig doesn't. He just well, I'm just it. using Craig for an example. Maybe Plantinga is the, is the example I should be using. But even Craig, because I've seen some of his debates, you don't think that he's kind of a modernized Christian? No, this is the tired old same stuff. It is, but compared to. Uh, 200 years ago? I mean, I can see it's Craig... The same I, I the only, totally the only modern Craig. thing, or more modern stuff, is that he's using updated numbers. Um, I guess I guess I'm not... Uh, I shouldn't be really talking too much about it because I don't know too much, but does he does he totally disregard any kind of, like, homosexuality, or does he go straight by the... Is he Catholic? What is he? I have no idea. Because there are some things that I've... You well, know, when I was listening to... I, I thought I heard him saying that, you know, it's changed. That was back then. This is now. We can, you know, and, and I can't really think of it, but to me it seemed like it was more popularized. I've never heard him know. talk about homosexuality. But then I find him so terribly weak. I find him so inane, so, you know, like so obvious. If he, if he starts the sentence, I can finish it for him because it's so predictable. Um, yeah, it's I haven't I, you know I, I need to go and watch more of these debates. Like I gotta be honest, when he brought the guests in, I have not seen any of his actual debates before this. I didn't even know who he was, so I have to go back and see all this, and then I can talk to you about some of these people. Okay. Like and, and like I said, I've been I've been watching his uh, stuff for like three or four years even. I mean, I guess what I'm like there's there's aspects of Islam that I've noticed that are so weird and anti-Islamic. They're yeah. like. Yeah. There's like Baha'is that don't even, what they believe, I, I'm not versed in Baha'ism, but they're totally on a whole nother, they're kind of like the Mormon version of, uh, <laughs> okay. you know, nice. <laughs> almost, but you know, more Mormons are kind of, they're more weird. Baha'is aren't weird. They don't really take the religion seriously. And this is why I was so happy that we had somebody who was going to explain the Ahmadiyyas to us. And then I can yeah. kick myself that I forgot the name that I can't contact and say, listen, please come back. Um, it makes me so angry if I do things like these. Like, you know, you, you just scribble it on a piece of paper and you think, ah, I'll put it in later. And then you don't and then the piece of paper disappears. I, rem I remember seeing a uh, thing about how Ahmadiyyas actually, when you go deep down into it, they still can't reject a lot of these things that we go into, like, for example, stoning, or, for example, uh, you know, th th they'll argue against it, and they'll try to limit the situations where it occurs, and how 
unlikely it is for that to happen, but they won't outright deny, okay, that's a totally bad thing we have to throw out. Mm -hmm. so, I just remember one guy who was telling me, yeah, um, you, can, you can always trust our dealers because we believe in evolution. I thought, what the fuck is wrong with yeah. you? And it turns <laughs> out he wasn't. He, he, was, he was lying to me. He was deceiving me. You know, how many just, don't believe in evolution? He was just trying to score some brownie points because in the end, it turns out that he believes in the, uh, the non-speciation. In other words, he says a dog is a dog and a cat is a cat and they will never become one another and things like that. You know, like the, the, the really primitive, ignorant, uneducated view that people have. It's amazing. And I thought, why are you doing this? You are destroying the image of an, of an entire group of people. Don't you have any sense of, you know, like like integrity or something like this? Nothing. Okay. Anyway, <clears throat> um, right, on the, right on the clock. Let's let's uh, leave it at that. Um, then, Closing Hoxie, comments? will you give us your last comment and then excuse yourself? And then we'll have Jeremy do the same. Just give your last some some comment and then say cheers. And then I'll do the hadith of the week, and then we'll say bye. Hoxie, come on. He's not even here. He's not even listening. Well, all right. Maybe you want to just let him go. Jeremy. Jeremy. Uh, Finally, he talks at the end. How's it going, man? Yeah, not bad, thanks. I love, I love, I love listening to some of William Lane Craig's debates because he'll, he's like a, he pro I find he approaches a bit like a lawyer almost, trying to argue a very yes. specific point. Yes. Like, well, it's yes. important to realize that we're, what we're not trying to prove here is that the Christian God is true. We're just trying to prove that uh, some some kind of uh, objective morality must exist, and therefore some kind of some kind of higher power. And by the time he gets to the end, okay, he's may, maybe he's made his argument, but. He's come nowhere near proving that his Christian God exists or anything like that. Exactly. It's just hilarious to, to you know, he what's very the lawyer like it, by the end of it. Yeah. Yep. Well spotted, well pointed out. Thank you very much. But you, you try and f find a, 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 a debate by the Scott William Lane Craig where he actually yeah. goes for uh, the particular Christian God that he's he's claiming to believe in. Now, he never he never does it because he knows he could he couldn't actually win that argument. That's why he's. He's always very careful to pick the boundaries of, of what he's trying to prove. Yeah, he really sticks to words and, and definitions of these words, and this is what I mean, you know, and, and very, very legal analysis like. Yeah. It's timeless, spaceless, and limitless. Yes, yes I get the creeps when I, when I hear this guy. Okay. okay, Jeremy, thank you very much. Thank you. See you next week. Yep. Then what I shall do now is read out the um, the hadith of the week, which I have uh, chosen, which is the Tirmidhi one from 175, and it's by our favorite Abu Huraira, who says, Allah's messenger said, when one of you is in the masjid, in the mosque, and he senses wind between his buttocks, then he should not exit until he hears a sound or smells an odor. That's pretty smart right there. That's some good tips. <laughs> I or... mean, it's, you know, for every day, everyday usage, you could use this every even when you're in the elevator. Don't yeah. exit the elevator until you can smell it. Otherwise, well, you never know what happens. I think that's one of the most awkward things. When you walk into an elevator where somebody has just farted, and you are the first one in, you turn around, and then a woman comes in after you. And you think, oh, fuck, I can't yeah. now explain this wasn't me. <laughs> this is so yeah. crazy. Okay, there you go. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, that was the Gin and Tonic Show. And please remember, if you want to come in, just go to the YouTube channel, Gin and Tonic Show. Then click on the About, and then you will see a live link, and you can be live. Otherwise, we, just let you, us what do you What do you think about maybe getting in uh, ideas about who we could get in as a guest. Something reasonable, not someone that we could never be able to get. And then maybe we could try getting someone that we get lots of requests for. Well, th the funny thing is, 
Um, I, I don't know if you've um, seen now the chat between Rationalizer and um, Truth Revealed. Now, this actually, he made a mistake, okay, because he said um, he wants to talk to me because I really gave him a run for his buddy and he was really frustrated. And then somebody else said, well, why don't you call the Gin and Tonic Show and debate them? You know, if you are so, so sure of yourself. And he says, okay, I will do that. But he thought the rationalizer was still on the gin and tonic show, so he contacted oh. the rationalizer instead of the gin and tonic show. So, oh, this would be interesting. This would be very interesting. Yeah, but it would be it would have been interesting if he had been here. Um, well, we, can, we can make it happen, right? No, people are not coming onto the gin and tonic show. LDM said, "Well, they're going to come on the 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 gin and tonic." They said, "Well, we're opening a new one, and then you will be the opening guest." Uh, we've had Dawa films uh, with uh, what's his name, Ramio. Who said, okay, we're going to come on the gym. Well, no, no, no. They said, we have a show and then you need to come on our show, but which never happened. So it's quite yeah. funny that everybody is opening other shows which never materialize instead of coming onto the gin and tonic show, which is functioning, which is regular, which is happening all the time, and nobody comes here and discusses Islam. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. But if you have somebody, drag them in. <laughs> okay, yeah. I was just going to say, it's it's. Look, looks like it not, seems like fear to me. Seems like fear to me. It is. It is. Well, All right, good guys. Show. See you next time.